Scott's bringing us a word from the Lord today. Uh, Scott Osborne's a farmer down south of here by Fairmont. And uh, let's pray. Father, we thank you. What a moving song. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb. To understand that you, God, became the sacrifice of all sacrifices. Father, I pray we understand that today. There's no other known to mankind where a king lays his life down for the people. But that's what you did. And because you did, we have it all. Father, I pray your blessing over Scott's word. It's your word that you will speak through him. It's exactly what the song was talking about. Bless him and bless us. And let us hear it and understand it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Last time I talked, my mouth got so dry, my lips stuck to my teeth. So. <laughs> Put a sort of a visual over there. You can see the shadow on the wall. When I was thinking of this, I had this vision of a great big curtain with the chair and the light behind it, the big shadow, and it would be magnificent. But this is what we got. So. This is what I came up with. Um, I want to talk to you today about uh, assurances, the assurance of our salvation. There's too many of us as believers out there who are not living in that assurance, not having received the assurance of their salvation. That assurance is something that we cannot talk about enough or discuss enough. It's too important. Everything starts with the assurance the growth, the maturity, the relationship with God and Christ starts with receiving that assurance. And every person can experience the assurance of salvation by recognizing three truths. The truth of the shadow, the truth of the flesh, and the truth of the substance. On the back of a, the bulletin on the bottom, the Webster's Dictionary's definition of shadow and substance. Define shadow as a reflected image, an imitation of something, an imperfect and faint representation. You can see the shadow on the wall. It's a faint imitation of something, an imperfect and faint representation. The dictionary defines substance as that which underlies all outward manifestations, permanent subject or cause of phenomenon, whether material or spiritual that which is real in distinction from that which is apparent. Listen to this image here, the chair is real, the substance and the shadow is a faint representation of what is real. Look up uh, Colossians 2 verse 17. It says, these are a shadow of things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Don't mistake the shadow for the real thing or the substance or treat the real thing like it's a shadow. We see shadows every day. We're standing all lately around here. We haven't seen a lot of shadows because the sun hasn't been out. But today, this morning, you can see plenty of shadows when you're outside. You can uh, put a light up and do shadow puppets on the wall. <laughs> it's a reflection of the substance that is real. But... If I stop moving, my, I can only do, I don't know, a snake or something. But if I move my hands, the shadows don't keep on going, doing their thing. It's just a reflection of the real thing, <clears throat> of the substance. In the late afternoon when the sun gets lower, our shadows get pretty long. You know, it's in, in the farm when I'm walking in the evening or late afternoon from the driveway towards the shop, 
I cast a pretty long shadow. And my shadow reaches my destination long before I get there. You know, when you get closer to the building, the shadow starts climbing up the wall. The shadow got there before I do. Jesus Christ cast a long shadow. These are a shadow of things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. His shadow got there before he did. The entirety of the Old Testament is a shadow. It's a shadow of things to come. And don't mistake the shadow for the real thing, or treat the real thing like it's a shadow. We have many examples in the Old Testament of this picture or the shadow of what's coming. Uh, Noah, Noah's Ark is a picture or example of the righteous being saved and the unrighteous not. Jonah in the belly of the fish for three days is a picture, an example, a shadow of what was to come. There are many other examples of what is to come, but we're talking about the assurance, the assurance of salvation. The whole of the Old Testament points to the coming of Christ, the coming of Christ. Christ hadn't arrived yet, but his shadow got there long before he did. Don't mistake the shadow for the real thing, or treat the real thing like it's a shadow. <clears throat> When Jesus was crucified, there were two others that were crucified with him. Both were convicted criminals who were truly guilty. They were not innocent of their crimes. They were receiving the justly rewards of their deeds. Go to Luke 23, 39. It says, One of the criminals who were hanged, railed at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? When Jesus, at this time, this man knew all too well the fear of God and knew what it was to be condemned. This man had lived the whole of his life in the shadow of salvation. There's no assurance in the shadow. He came from a time when there was no assurance in their righteousness. Don't mistake the shadow for the real thing or treat the real thing like it's a shadow. Old Testament sacrifice, that exchanging of innocence for guilt, of sin for righteousness, was a faint reflection of the real thing, of the substance. There's no assurance in that. There was no assurance in that because once they had received that righteousness, the righteousness was in their hands. They only maintained it until they slipped in sin again, and then they lost it. The righteousness was only righteous until it wasn't, until they slipped in sin and they lost it. And they would have to, and I would imagine with quite urgency, get back to that altar and sacrifice again. Their righteousness was in their hands. Now, Jesus was in the shadow. There was power in that shadow that innocence was exchanged for guilt, or guilt exchanged for innocence. There was unrighteousness exchanged for righteousness. But it was just the shadow. It did not pay the full debt. It only paid the interest. It delayed the due date of the full payment due. Man is too unreliable to maintain that righteousness. They believed in the shadow, and Jesus Christ was in the shadow, but it was just that, a shadow. There was no assurance in that. No assurance because they were unreliable to hang on to it. And they did fear God, as this guy, man said. Do you not fear God? He knew what it was to be condemned because their salvation was in their hands. They had to do something to receive it, and they could lose it. There's no assurance at that in the shadow. Don't mistake the shadow for the real thing. This shadow on the wall here, of the chair, we can see it. We can see that it is a chair, a reflection of the chair, but I can't go sit in that. I can't go sit in that shadow. There's no substance there. 
is a reflection of what is to come. Too many of us are believing in the shadow, stuck in that, not moving on. Or Luke 23, 41. He says, And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. The shadow did become flesh. This man is talking about that now. This man has done nothing wrong. He recognized that this was Jesus and that he had, was without sin. But the flesh still was not the substance. It was not the finished work of Christ. The flesh, the truth of the flesh came to bridge the shadow to the substance. Jesus had come in the flesh to proclaim that he was going to become the substance. He was the one that was going to become the real thing, the real finished work. He came and he taught and he ministered and he performed miracles to show that it was he that would become the substance, but he was not yet the substance. The Old Testament shadow was gone. Christ had arrived, but there is no assurance in that flesh. The job was not yet finished. We can see it, but there's no assurance in that salvation because he was not finished. His job was not done. But he was here to bridge that gap between the flesh and the substance. When Jesus was here, he was teaching and performing miracles. One of the miracles he performed was the raising of Lazarus. Jesus had a servant or a messenger come up to him and said, Your friend Lazarus is sick. And Jesus said simply, This illness does not lead to death. And he later said that Lazarus has just fallen asleep. Now he knew at that point that Lazarus had died. But for Jesus, life and death are not in the beating of the heart. Life is Jesus and sin is death. So he simply said, this illness does not lead to death. Lazarus has just fallen asleep. It was a picture of what was to come. Healing the blind man was also another shadow or picture of what was to come. People around him began to believe, but they were believing in the flesh. There's no assurance in that. The flesh had not yet become the finished work, the substance of the assurance of our salvation. The flesh is not the substance, but still a shadow of what's to come. Too many of us are believing in that flesh. In my personal life, the shadow was at a time in my life when I knew that Jesus would forgive and God would give grace, but it was something that I had to do something to obtain that. I knew it would happen, but how could I get there? There's no way I could get there to that level to be worthy of it, to receive it. And if I got it, I definitely couldn't hang on to it. It was in my hands, because I was only believing in the shadow. And the time of Old Testament sacrifice had passed. I don't think Riley would have liked it too much if I would have snuck in there and stole one of his sheep and then sacrificed it. The time of that no assurance had passed. There was assurance in the promises of God, but no assurance in the flesh. It was not the finished work. He had arrived. The chair is there, but it cannot hold me yet. The flesh is not the substance, but still a shadow is what's to come. Don't mistake the shadow for the real thing, or treat the real thing like it's a shadow. Well, that flesh did become the substance. Jesus did die on the cross. He did take upon himself all the sin of the world. 
he became the fulfilled, finished work. Now, when we believe into that, that this chair is a finished work, for this example, now this chair is now the finished work of Christ. There's no longer a sacrifice coming. This is the finished product. It is Christ taking on all of our sin and is now here in the substance. It is not the shadow and it is not the flesh. It is the substance. It's the finished work of God. Now this chair promises me that it will hold me. It's no longer the shadow. If I would have tried sitting in the shadow, it wouldn't work so well. It was not the flesh. It was now the finished work. But do I have the assurance in this, that this is the finished work of Christ, and that I can live in the assurance of my salvation? The shadow couldn't do it. There's no shadow, no assurance in the shadow. Christ in the flesh was here to bridge that gap and to proclaim that he was the one to become the substance. And now it is the substance. But do I have the assurance? Standing here, I can believe all the way to my doom that this chair will hold me if I sit in it. But I'm not assured of it, not standing here. The only way I can be assured that this chair will hold me is if I sit in it. This chair is holding me. I am assured of that. It's evidenced. You can see it. It is holding me. This is the assurance. Is when we are sitting in this chair, we are assured that it will hold us. Standing over there, I had no assurance. I could believe it all I wanted that it would hold me, but until I sat in it, I'm not assured. That's what this whole picture is about. I can believe in the shadow, no salvation, no assurance. I can believe that Jesus Christ did come in the flesh and that he did these miracles and that he did, I can even believe that he died on the cross and still have no assurance. The assurance doesn't come until I gave that chair the opportunity to fulfill his promise to me. The one who sent that chair promised me he would hold me. But until I sit on it, I didn't give the chair the opportunity to fulfill that promise. It all changed at that moment on the cross. We no longer live in the time of no assurance. We now live in the assurance. But even the finished work of Christ is not assured to us until we give him the opportunity to fulfill his promises to us. Let's go back to Luke 23:39. This first man, one of the criminals, railed at him saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. This man here wanted Christ to give him, to do an action to give him the assurance. He railed at him saying, if you're not the Christ, do something. Save yourself on us. If you save yourself on us, I will believe that you are the Christ. He wanted the action to give him, an action by Christ to give him the assurance. What about the other man? Luke 23, 42, and 43. This man was so filled with the assurance of the promises of Christ and that he was becoming the substance that he simply says, remember me. Just remember me when you come into your kingdom. That's believing into and receiving the assurance of Christ. The assurance caused the action. The assurance 
saying, just remember me, gave Christ the opportunity to fulfill his promise. And what did Christ say after that? He said, truly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. The assurance gave the opportunity for Christ to fulfill his promise. The other man wanted the, the action first. Christ, do this, and then I will believe in you. And what did Christ say to that man? Nothing. Silence. This man did hear Christ speak one more time when he said, I do not know you. Just as the man who said, Remember me when you come into the kingdom. Jesus spoke to him again when he said, Well done, good and faithful servant. Which way are we living? Are we living that way? Are we giving Christ the opportunity to fulfill his promises to us? Are we receiving the assurance first to cause the action, to give Christ the opportunity to act? Or are we telling him, prove it to me first before I sit in you. How can I have the assuredness that that chair will hold me until I sit in it? That chair can do anything. It can stand there for 100 years, but until I sit in it, it's not giving it the opportunity to do what it's asking. It's not giving, me, giving it the opportunity to hold me, to support me. It's the same thing with Christ. We receive the assurance to cause the action by him, to allow him the opportunity to react to us. We can see this in our lives. Are we living that way? Are we doing things that only believers can do? Do we have the assurance that we can give Christ the opportunity to fulfill his promises to us? Only believers can do that. Are we doing things and living in a way that only believers can do? Hebrews 10, 19. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, we have the confidence to enter into these holy places because we've received the assurance. We don't have that confidence until we've sat in it. We've allowed him the opportunity to fulfill his promises to us. In 10, 22 and 23 of Hebrews, it says, Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who has promised is faithful. Are we holding fast or are we wavering? Don't mistake the shadow for the real thing or treat the real thing like a shadow. Christ is no longer the shadow. And he is no longer in the flesh. He is the finished work, the substance. It is not of what is still to come. It is here. But I can believe in that, and it doesn't change a thing until I allow him the opportunity to fulfill his promise to me or to us. Too many people are stuck in that. Too many people are stuck believing in the shadow, believing in the flesh, believing that the work of Christ is finished, but are not giving him the opportunity to fulfill his promises to us by sitting in the chair. Like I said, when you sit in that chair, you're causing it to hold you. You're giving it the opportunity to fulfill its promise. Are we holding fast or are we wavering? Because we do have the full assurance and have the confidence to enter the holy places, we need to proclaim that. Are we proclaiming that? Can we stand up and say that? If we are wavering in the assurance of our salvation, we are treating the power, salvation power of Christ as if it is just another shadow. He is no longer just a shadow. He is the substance. Can we stand up and say that I am 
the righteousness of Christ? Can you stand up and say, I've been redeemed? Can you stand up and say, I am holy, with the full assurance that is true? Can you even quietly, in a silent prayer, say that to God? Or does it make you uncomfortable? Uncomfortable because you're not really sure. You have the assurance of salvation. You have it if you sit in the, that chair and prove that it will hold you. It's a package deal. The salvation, assurance came with the salvation. We need to be able to stand up and proclaim that. Can you do that? Are you of those that say that I don't want to sound like I'm boasting? If someone comes up to you and says, do you know where you'll, your first breath will be after your last breath here? And they ask you, are you going to go to heaven and be with Jesus? And your answer is, well, I sure hope so. Or I think so. You're treating the salvation power of Christ as another shadow. It is not boasting to proclaim the power and the finished work of Jesus. To not proclaim it is to deny it. Don't say that you're, you know, I'm just trying to be humble, have a humble heart, and I can't tell to somebody, yes, I know I'm assured of my salvation. To not proclaim it is to deny it. Three times when Christ was in the flesh, Peter had the opportunity to proclaim that Christ was who he said he was. Three times he had the opportunity to say, yes, he is the Messiah, yes, he is the Son of God, and yes, I am a disciple of him. All three times Peter denied it. Jesus did not look at Peter after he had denied him and say, oh, my humble servant, Peter. He had missed the opportunity to proclaim who Jesus was. And when Peter realized what he had done, he wept. He wept because he denied who Christ was in the flesh. Are we denying the salvation power of Christ if we're not assured in our salvation and we can't proclaim that? And there's also those that can't seem to get past the guilt of their past to proclaim these things. I'm telling you that it's okay to feel redeemed. It's okay to feel righteous. It's okay to feel holy. You've been forgiven and buried with Christ. And a new you was resurrected. A brand new you without shame. It's okay to feel redeemed and righteous because it's not for the old you, it's for the new you. The new you can stand up and say it. I have been made righteous and I have been redeemed. And it was without shame because the old you was buried. Now we have received this knowledge of truth from the Holy Spirit and through the Word of God. Go to Hebrews 10, 26 through 31. For if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. How much worse... Worst punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has spurned the Son of God and has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has outraged the Spirit of grace? For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, and again the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. It is by grace and only by grace that we are saved from what we deserve. So here's the tension. Here's what we need to answer. By denying 
the finished work of Christ by saying, oh, I think so, or I believe so, and not being able to proclaim that we are righteous and we are redeemed after receiving the knowledge of truth, if we're waiting for something else to come, we'll be waiting a long time because there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. If we are doing them things, how much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has spurned the Son of God? By grace we are saved from these things, but if we aren't proclaiming the, power, the assurance and the resurrection power of Christ by saying, I'm not sure, I don't know, it's denying. It's denying him and profaning the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctifying and outraging the spirit of grace. Where we are at in this, whether we're in the shadow, believing in the shadow, believing in the flesh, or believing in the substance, the Holy Spirit has revealed that to you. Right now it is being revealed to you. If this message has made you feel condemned, you're believing in the shadow. If it's made you feel conflicted, oh, I'm not sure I get it you're saying, but I don't think I can do that, I don't think I can proclaim that, you're believing in the flesh and living in the flesh. But if this, is, if this message has made you feel the freedom and the joy that comes with the assurance of the salvation, that's where you are. You're in that assurance of your salvation. Are we living in a way that allows Christ the opportunity to fulfill his promises to us? The assurance, having received that, is what will be evidence in our lives, in the fruit. We will bear fruit. We will be in the word. We will be in prayer. The man who was saved at the cross did not have to go be baptized, did not have to worship in praise songs, did not have to be in the Word, did not have to spend time in prayer to receive that assurance of salvation. But he also was hanging on a cross about to die. We are, have the blessing of still being alive. That is what living Christians do. They are in the Word. They are in prayer. It comes with the assurance. It is the evidence of that assurance. It's just what saved people do. Are you giving Christ the opportunity to fulfill His promises to you? Don't treat the shadow like the real thing or mistake the real thing for another shadow.